So our next talk, I'm led to believe, has a live demo component as well. The talk is EpiScan 360. Uh, it's by Will Hamilton, Joan Campoy, Jamie Byrne, Herman Herman, Jeff McMahill, and Srinivas Narsimhan. Srinivas. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so this is uh, Jimmy, I'm Srinivas. We are going to try and set this up. Uh, if you hadn't seen this yesterday, uh, here's another chance for you to see if it works, we'll see. Uh, so uh, let me uh, begin my talk while, uh, oh, it's set up, okay, so let's keep running like this. Okay, let me begin my talk. I think uh, 3D sensors are useful for uh, many different applications, and the previous speaker left out a few of them. Uh, so I think from consumer to health to manufacturing, uh, to agriculture, to robotics, 3D sensors are used a lot. And uh, the design space of 3D sensors is pretty interesting, and it includes trade-offs, making trade-offs along many different axes, uh, range, resolution, accuracy, field of view. And the previous talk was about short range, narrow field of view, uh, high resolution, perhaps, uh, in spatial domain. Uh, right. And so uh, this talk is going to look at another corner of this design space. and. Uh, our goal is to be able to design an active illumination-based uh, 3D sensor uh, that has an omnidirectional field of view, uh, so it will be very useful for robotics, for VR, and so on. Uh, one that also has higher uh, spatial and temporal resolution, and it uses energy-efficient active illumination, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, here. And But more importantly, I want to make this sensor as compact as possible. And so. Uh, so let me start by talking about active illumination. Uh, and there is an energy efficient way of doing it, and there is an inefficient way of doing it. So let's show you the inefficient way of doing it, and we'll call this regular imaging. Uh, you have a light source, you have a sensor, so this is active illumination based. Uh, typically what you do is you illuminate the entire scene, right? And you capture an image. And this has problem, two different problems. One is it could have indirect illumination that can cause all sorts of problems when you're scanning metallic objects and so on. Um, and also, it could have problems in ambient light. So if you're illuminating, if you're taking your light power and spreading it out completely, uh, the power per pixel is going to be so tiny that it cannot beat sunlight, for example. Right? And so ambient illumination is a problem. And uh, for the past few years, my group, as well as uh, Kiros's group, we've gotten together and we've built a bunch of imaging systems uh, called epipolar imaging systems. And the idea is that you're illuminating an epipolar plane and you're imaging the corresponding epipolar plane simultaneously, okay? And if you just scan this from top to bottom, uh, as this video shows, uh, by cleverly synchronizing the illumination with the rolling shutter of your sensor, uh, you can capture all of this in one shot, right? And so this is an energy efficient way of illumination because it has, again, two advantages. One is because it's epipolar imaging, it does not capture any indirect light. And second is because it's concentrating all of its light onto a plane rather than spreading it out, uh, it's uh, very energy efficient. It can work outdoors, indoors, and so on. So uh, we've built a few different prototypes over the years. And uh, we've actually distributed to a few people in the community as well uh, for their application. So you have a, a, a laser projector that's scanning pretty fast, and it's synced with a rolling shutter camera, and you have a really uh, high-quality epipolar 3D imaging system. Okay. Uh, so this was sort of the setup for the talk. And one of the problems with this uh, setup is that we can only do very small fields of view. Okay, and that's because as you have wider fields of view, you will have distortion and you can't do epipolar imaging uh, that easily. So this talk is about trying to extend epipolar imaging to wide fields of view, okay? Uh, so let's think about the three different ideas that in passive imaging has been used before to create these wide fields of view. Uh, one is curved mirrors, okay? Uh, so this is, uh, you know, since the mid-90s, uh, there's been lots of work in catadioptric imaging where a camera is observing a curved mirror. It could be a parabolic, hyperbolic mirror, and you get uh, a full 360-degree uh, view. And this is, this is great. And if you use stereo in this case, one of the problems is that the epipolar lines are curved. So 
uh, points corresponding to one view. In the other view, the epipolar lines are curved. And so it's hard to make a sensor that just captures these uh, strange circular curves, right? And instead of mirrors, you could use wide angle lenses, okay? Uh, wide angle, this is a fisheye lens. And uh, again, you have distortions. And so it's very hard to capture epipolar lines at the top because it's curved, right? And so uh, there is a recent sensor by Kiros and uh, Kiros Kutlakos and Roman Genov uh, who's, who are trying to uh, create these uh, programmable masks at very high speed, and that could be a possible solution here, okay? But there's still a long way to go in terms of engineering that. So there's actually another, uh, you know, if you wanted to get a wide field of view, you can use multiple systems, right? So if you look at uh, a ladybug, uh, you have six cameras put together. In this case, each of these is wide field of view. So there's a few cameras are sufficient to get a full spherical field of view. Uh, but if you wanted to use episcans, which are very no narrow fields of view, uh, you would have to you know, put together a monstrous system that 18 episcans to cover the entire sphere. So uh, using multiple narrow fields of view is not a good idea. Um, but uh, if you look at the same image that's distorted, uh, there is an interesting observation to make here. Uh, so if you look at the distortion that is there, and if you focus on, let's say, the center line, okay? So I'll just animate it again. So you look at the center line. That does not have distortions in the vertical direction. So the center line is distortion. There's only distortion in one plane, but not in the other axis, okay? And so what you can do is you can use a line sensor that's aligned to the center of this lens, in most lenses, it is true if there's lens uh, you know, uh, imperfections that could be off. Uh, but in most cases, if you align the sensor with this uh, center line, you can still do epipolar imaging. Right? And so that's the idea in this paper. It's a very, very simple idea. Uh, you can use a wide angle lens in one direction. Right? And so this is, uh, this is what we are doing. So in terms of illustration, so you could have two imagers, uh, 1D imagers. And they could have really wide angle lenses put in front of them. So you could have 120, 180 degree uh, wide angle lens. You could use your uh, light source, which could be a laser sheet. And this laser sheet could either be modulated using uh, DOE, which is a random dot uh, that you can project onto the scene to do active stereo. Or it could be a modulated laser so that you can do uh, time of flight. Now, this is a 1D uh, epipolar imaging system. How do we create 360? Uh, this is very simple, we just spin it, okay? And so uh, in this particular case, the baseline, as I've shown you, is vertical, right? And of course, you can rotate it to get a horizontal baseline, and this is what uh, we end up with here, okay? So sounds like a very simple thing, but designing this and actually putting together a very compact system is very challenging, and the paper discusses all of our uh, efforts in this space, and I'm just going to show you the design quickly here, okay? And so uh, this is the 1D epi-scan system where you have two cameras, two line scan imagers, and you have two laser line projectors with the custom DOE. And here, again, the challenge was to get a wider uh, angle. Uh, getting a 90-degree angle with DOEs is not that easy, uh, so we uh, made do with 60 degree uh, fields of view, two of them to cover for 120 degree. And so this is a unit that we want to use to spin, right? And so uh, Facebook, when they uh, wanted to support this, they said you want to have even more resolution. And so uh, what we had to do is we had to build three such modules, uh, three epi scans. So you have two of them back to back and one of them looking slightly above because they wanted to see the ceiling as well for some reason. Uh, and so uh, this is all mechanically aligned and the masses are distributed properly so that it can spin uh, accurately, okay? And so this is the, uh, the prototype that we built. And here you have uh, the operational fields of view of the system. So you have uh, two sort of this butterfly uh, diagram. You have two wide angle fields of view in 1D that is spun. And of course, these two things are going to multiply the frame rate. Right, so if you had one frame per second here, you're going to get two frames per second. And of course, another third uh, system that's looking slightly upward. And so in terms of compactness, uh, this device that we built is uh, comparable to a little bit like a Coke can. 
it's, it's bigger than that, but uh, that's, that's the comparison. But more importantly, one of the things that we found in the market, if you look at lots of these uh, 3D systems that are omnidirectional, uh, whether it's the Velodyne HDL, eHalo that Google Jump uses, uh, and so on, they are much, much bigger, okay? And so compactness is uh, an axis that you have to manage uh, when you're trying to develop a 3D sensor. And so here's a prototype exploded view of this sensor, right? So it has a few different PCBs that control each of these modules and one PCB that gets all the data together and does FPGA programming. Uh, and the bottom side is all about the spinning, right? So you have the motor, you have the slip ring and so on. Uh, so if you uh, look at, oops, if you look at the bottom side, uh, it has a slip ring. That's how the data gets through in a spinning device. And you have an encoder ring and you have the motor, right? And uh, this slip ring really uh, dictates the spatiotemporal resolution you can get out of this device. And so this plot shows uh, the data rate at which you can uh, get 3D data. And so this uh, blue plot here is trying to tell you at a constant data rate of let's say 80 megabytes per second, uh, what kinds of spatial resolution and temporal resolution you can build, right? And so of uh, one particular point you can see is 14 megapixels at seven and a half hertz uh, is an example. Now, uh, the slip ring has uh, a, an interesting uh, life story of its own. If you run it slow, it just lasts longer. And, but if it goes uh, much faster than its uh, particular uh, speed, uh, its uh, life is unknown. So if you go really, really fast, uh, it's unclear how long this will last. Uh, but that requires a new kind of uh, slip ring to be built. Uh, now, when I talk about these kinds of spatiotemporal resolutions, uh, I can just plot it as a bunch of uh, point cloud, and this is at 10%, so I can't show you the full point cloud because it's too dense. And this is at 10%, so if you had 14 megapixels in a room uh, at seven and a half hertz, you can capture everything you want in that room. And so this is the current uh, prototype, and it shows how it's, uh, so here we have a, a really nice sleek cover, but uh, when you remove the cover, you can see how it's uh, rotating. Um, and so we have, uh, we wanted to build a high resolution, wide field of view, active illumination 3D, and this is the uh, kind of uh, prototype that we have, uh, up to about 800, uh, eight scans, eight, eight hertz, and up to even uh, 160 uh, megabits per second. So let me show you some results. And I think uh, Hero has distributed some uh, red-blue glasses. So uh, you should use left is red. And uh, so if, if you don't have a red-blue glass, you can borrow it from your uh, neighbor. You don't have to put it on yet. I'll tell you when to put it on. <laughs> so maybe you should take it off now. Because the next slide, it shows you without. Uh, so I would say take it off now. I'll, uh, okay, uh, because it becomes darker. So this is the uh, live raw output of this device. Uh, this is running at maybe about uh, one, one or two hertz. And uh, Jimmy, Will, and uh, Joanne, they're in the conference room. And you can see the laser uh, line pattern, right? And so uh, this is actually what the DOE is giving us. And this is what it's going to help you to do stereo, right? So when you have a blank wall, uh, it's not going to be easy to do stereo. Uh, but if you project this pattern, it's going to help you to do stereo, right? So that was the idea. And so uh, if you just ran um, a one-line stereo algorithm, we should really do deep learning, OK? Uh, there's no excuse for us not doing deep learning. But uh, if we just did one-line open CV, you get a depth map. Uh, we, do, you know, we don't handle borders and all of that stuff. And this is showing the effect of the laser, right? The laser is very, very important here. Uh, without active illumination, uh, you wouldn't get anything. So uh, you get a depth map here. Uh, this is the order disparity map. And if you turn off the laser, you get garbage, OK? Uh, so really, uh, the effect of illumination, uh, this is core uh, to this work. And you have uh, this laser dot pattern that can be used to do stereo. Now you can put on your glasses.
because it's hard to see the depth map, so it's much easier to see the um, uh, actual stereo. Uh, so if you put on your glasses the right way, uh, you should be able to see 3D here. Right? You should be able to see 3D of people moving back and forth. Uh, you should be able to see the uh, bottle or objects on the table. And remember, this is a weird video because the stereo baseline is vertical. So we are spinning the device like this. The stereo baseline is vertical. So don't turn your head. Just look straight. Okay. Uh, so how many of you have, are not seeing 3D? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is an example of, you know, you can see the line patterns, the laser line patterns as well. Now, uh, if you go partially outdoor, uh, you can remove your glasses now. Uh, you can partially outdoor and indoor. So you'll see the line patterns close by, but then, of course, outdoor, this device is not, uh, does not have a baseline that can see really far away. It was designed for indoor 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter room, uh, mostly for VR. So on. So this is an. Ex now you can put on your glasses. It's fun. It's fun. Uh, and you can see uh, the 3D here. Right. How much time? Ah, excellent. Perfect. Okay. Uh, everybody saw it for a while. Okay. Uh, this is yet another example. It's, in our, it's at our NREC. It's a really large robotics facility. Uh, Jimmy is pushing a cart. Uh, you will see cars go by. Some of these are uh, autonomous uh, cars in CMU. Uh, so you have these cars going by. You can see 3D there. Uh, it's, a, it's a large space. You can do uh, 3D, uh, at least observe 3D in, uh, in, in a large space. Of course, while the, our uh, active illumination range is only a few meters, you can do it outdoors. And if it's far enough away, uh, you, you will just get passive stereo. Right? So this is outdoor. Uh, there's no 3D shown here. So it's just the raw output. And I'm going to show the 3D here. So now you can see the 3D. Full spherical field of view uh, 3D. Okay, that's it's almost done. So just a quick uh, recap of some of the limitations. We have some engineering limitations in aligning all of these components together. So that needs to be manufactured properly. Uh, we haven't had the chance to put an IR lens so that it can work outdoor at a reasonable range and some engineering that needs to be done. So uh, Jimmy is going to uh, run a demo now and uh, while I take questions. Thank you. So we have time for just a couple of few questions. So it looked like, uh, maybe it was just me, but it looked like the outdoor results were far more impressive than the indoor. Any reason why? And we have time for one very quick question.
Okay, there will be an exam on this. <laughs> All right, we're running a little over time, so let's thank our speaker.